There is no shortage of students studying for careers in math and science. There's a shortage of jobs. That's the simple bottom line finding of a new study from the Urban Institute. The study shows that between 1985 and 2000, 435,000 U.S. citizens and permanent residents a year graduated with bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in science and engineering. That's three times the number of jobs in science and engineering added per year, 150,000, during that time. Separately, Michael Teitelbaum at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation told Congress last week that neither he nor a separate study by the RAND Corporation can find any evidence of worker shortages. These studies are not anomalies. Bottom line is that all of our research at Duke and now at Harvard shows the same thing, that there's no shortage of engineers, there's no shortage of scientists, companies aren't going abroad because of skills, they're going abroad because it's cheaper. As a result, Wadra says that more than half of the engineering graduate students at Duke don't pursue engineering as a career. And there is another indicator that the market is anything but short of scientists and engineers. We should be trying to figure out how to incentivize uh, students to, to advance in these math and science areas. It's clearly that there's no shortage. If there's a shortage, the supply and demand wages would be going up in these areas. Wages in the science and engineering fields over the last five years when adjusted for inflation have been basically flat. Now, Lou, that's the Urban Institute, the Alfred P. P. Sloan Foundation, Duke, Harvard, the Rand Corporation, studies done independently of each other, different researchers, different funding, all reaching the same basic conclusion that there is no worker shortage. Lou, the problem is not a lack of workers. The problem, these studies all conclude, is a lack of companies hiring them. And as we've reported many, many times on this program, those companies either offshore the work or, as you mentioned at the top, demand more H-1B visas and then pay those workers less. Lou? Yeah, we've been reporting on this issue, the exporting of American jobs, the outsourcing of American jobs, middle class jobs, for four years. Uh, in point of fact, uh, the idea uh, that all of these uh, highly regarded, highly respected institutions have found the same thing that we have reported here for four years. Uh, Congress, just last week, the Subcommittee on uh, Technology and Innovation, mm -hmm suggesting that 30 to 40 percent of American jobs now are at risk of being outsourced in addition to the H-1B problem. Right. Let's put this in some context. Let's just deal with that H-1B program which all of these companies want to bring uh, those foreign workers in under. What's the number of uh, Indian companies that are using H-1B visas, seeking H-1B visas uh, for the purpose of outsourcing those jobs right here in the United States? It, well, five of the top six users of the H-1B visa program, Lou, as you well know, are Indian companies. Yes, I did. But I wanted, because I'm in Seattle, Washington tonight, Bill Tucker, and I thank you very much. I, wanted, I want to repeat that just for the purpose, the benefit, the illumination, the education, the enlightenment of one of the, this city's most famous citizens, Microsoft Chairman Bill Gates. Uh, Bill Gates is among those calling for more H-1B visas. In fact, Bill Gates wants an unlimited number of H-1B visas, and we really think it's important that he be brought up to date on this issue. Gates testified before a Senate committee in March. By the way, he was the only witness, and there was only one fellow chairing it. That was Senator Ted Kennedy. And Gates said the United States should allow, as he put it, an infinite number of foreign workers. We can't get above infinite, no matter what we do. We have to welcome the great minds in this world not shut them out of our country. Unfortunately, our immigration policies are driving away the world's best and brightest precisely when we need them the most. Bill Gates, you just heard the Rain Corporation, the Urban Institute, Harvard University, come on and look at the facts. Most of those H-1B visas are being used by Indian companies seeking to outsource jobs at a very very reduced wage. In fact, most of the H-1B computer professionals in this country are brought in at the lowest skill levels. About half of the H-1B visa computer professionals recently admitted to the United States, in fact, earn less than typical entry-level salaries. So much for the advanced best minds. These are entry-level jobs, not the highly skilled jobs seeking those H-1B visas. So, Mr. Gates, I certainly hope that you and I could have a discussion on that. I'm sure that you'd be delighted to do that.
but I'm going to ask for something less than an infinite number of H-1B visas on when we compromise. As a matter of fact, I want to return to two, year ago, two years ago levels. Um, and what I'm going to point out are that there are serious design flaws in these H-1B and L-1 visas. Um, so before I get into those flaws, let me turn to some of the goals that have been laid out by uh, many of the industry and university lobbyists. Uh, you know, the first claim that they make is that, that if they uh, don't have access to these H-1B workers, they're going to be forced to outsource jobs. So they're going to hire those foreign workers wherever they may be, and if we don't bring them here, they're going to hire them uh, in their home countries. And then the second claim they make is that the H-1B program is basically a gateway to immigration. And so they make that very strong connection between this guest worker program and immigration and permanent immigration, and make the argument that, in fact, the H-1B, that immigration, increasing high skill immigration is contingent upon increasing the H-1B program. But I would argue that, in fact, the evidence uh, supports neither claim. Um, in fact, the, law, the first claim is that the H-1B program is, if we don't increase it, it's, uh, we're going to outsource more jobs. Uh, that's not supported by the evidence. When you look at the top H-1B users, they're actually offshore outsourcing firms. They are firms whose whole reason for being is to outsource jobs. Right? So if we increase that, you would expect actually more jobs to, to uh, be outsourced. Um, and the second one doesn't make much sense because uh, it, it's, it's actually many of these companies do not use this as a bridge to immigration. In fact, the leading users of the H-1B program do not sponsor a lot of green cards. And I'll give you one example. Uh, Wipro uh, uh, Technologies, which is one of the large offshore outsourcing firms, applied for 19,000 H-1Bs last year. They all applied for 69 green cards. So 19,000 H-1B applications, 69 green cards. It doesn't sound like a very strong link to immigration. And this is one of the leading users of the H-1B program. So that, that connection is increasingly tenuous. So let me just highlight three of the design flaws, I think, that are in the H-1B program. The first is that there's no labor market test. And I think this is the most significant one. Um, what's, basically, the, I think the Department of Labor put it very succinctly. They said, quote, H-1B workers can be hired even when a qualified U.S. worker wants the job, and a U.S. worker can be displaced from the job in favor of a foreign worker. Right? So there is no labor market test. That means that a company can prefer a foreign worker over a U.S. worker. They don't have to look for a U.S. worker first, and in fact can displace a U.S. worker with a foreign worker on an H-1B. What's really remarkable about this fact is that how many people, how many journalists as well as politicians actually get this wrong? They actually promulgate a fallacy. And, and this is the Los Angeles Times in an article about two or three weeks ago, San Diego Union Tribune, uh, and even the Wall Street Journal in a front page story about uh, this program at the height of the immigration debate got it wrong. They all assume that there is a uh, is a labor market test. In fact, there, there isn't one. And in fact, many of these politicians that are involved in the discussion have promulgated this fallacy, including um, Senators McCain and Kennedy in, a, in an article in, in the uh, San Francisco Chronicle last year. They claimed that the H-1B program did have a labor market test when it didn't. Um, and you see this with, with other politicians writing to constituents saying that, that H-1B hires should be uh, uh, H-1B workers should be hired as a last recourse, that, that folks should look for American workers first.